Lord God in heaven, we thank you for your goodness and for your grace. And Lord God, um, God, I just pray that, uh, that you would be present in this place. And God, that we would be remembering, Lord, always more and more what you have done for us. Lord, uh, remembering where we were, and then, Lord God, what you have done. And God, that would lead us to being thankful. And as we walk in thankfulness more and more, Lord God, that would lead us to you and to be in your presence, to be mindful of you in every moment. And Lord God, that we would live in our lives in such a way, Lord, that our lives look like little Jesuses alive on earth today. Not that we will ever be you, Jesus, or be able to live up to what you have done for us. Or that uh, we would do this in, in an effort to try and pay you back, but th that, that is not it. But that you, Jesus, would just fill us so much of yourself as we let go of ourselves and our way and our will and our demands and wants and pleasures and... Lord, that, that, uh, that people would see Jesus in us and that that would captivate their hearts to want to know you. Oh, God, that we would live in such a way that people would look at us and what they see would captivate their hearts to want to know you. Lord God, I pray that as I speak that you would, um, you would speak through me, you would guard my words. I also pray, Lord God, that you would bless the hearer and that by your Holy Spirit, Lord God, that you would be illuminating truth to us and making us look within to, to investigate our heart and mind in the topic that we have this morning. And Lord God, that we would leave here a little bit changed, a little bit closer to you, a little bit more like you. God, be with the teachers downstairs as they teach our little ones. Lord God, just put a blessing on them of uh, your Holy Spirit and just that they would have that gift of teaching to make it clear and, and understandable to these little hearts and then open up the, the little hearts, Lord God, that are listening. Father, uh, let, us, uh, let them not be, let us not be like the early Israelites, Lord God, who were hearing but never hearing, who were seeing but not really seeing. And because of that, Lord God, they were not, they were not understanding uh, let them be hearing, let them be seeing, help them understand, I pray, by the pre presence of your Holy Spirit. And then do the same for us, too, as we listen to you this morning, uh, through the, what you've given me, Lord God. We thank you for your love and grace. We thank you, Lord God, that you are in this place. We thank you that you died on the cross for our sins and that you showed by rising again that you defeated sin and death and that we have hope in you. In the name of Jesus, we pray these things. Amen. So we are in Acts, and uh, if you noticed, um, as we kind of read through the scriptures this morning, we are, we, we are, we are jumping into a pretty healthy, uh, to a pretty healthy passage. Uh, I'm not going to read through that entire passage again, um, and I'm, uh, we're not really going to look at the, the entire passage kind of section by section. We might spend a little bit of time on that uh, next week. Uh, but for this week, we are just kind of going to look at the one kind of topic that really pops out at us, or at least it popped out on me, and I want to talk about that. And, uh, and so we'll just jump into the text. What we are looking at this morning uh, is kind of Paul's circumstance. He was able to get to Jerusalem. Um, and like we talked about uh, the week before last, uh, the, the church was excited to hear what he had to say about what, he, what God had been doing through him and how God had been working through him in the last several years and uh, how the, the gospel of Jesus Christ was spreading to the Gentiles. And then the church asked him to kind of prove that he was still... He still honored the Old Testament, and we kind of looked at that and just some of the, the misconceptions that are, that are taught from that passage. 
And uh, we looked at how there is one gospel, and that's the gospel of Jesus Christ. And what happens is as he enters the temple, as we listen to the, the message this morning, these people come and they really attack him. The Jews are very dead set against this man. They see him as a very big troublemaker. And what we see in this passage, first and foremost, is when we start and jump into this passage, what I want us to kind of focus on as we kind of move into it is the man that Paul was. The man that Paul was, right? We're going to take a moment and we're just going to look at, and I want you to be paying attention to the man that Paul was. But as you are kind of paying attention to that, I also want to kind of ask yourself, okay, who was the person I was? Who was the person? I know that's not worded exactly, right? But it fits with the, okay? Paul was, I was, Right? The, Paul, the person Paul was, and then the person you were, right? And then, and then, then we're going to look at the incredible change. I want, to, I want you to be thinking about the incredible change in you. And maybe as we're thinking about that, as we go kind of to the topic, we see Paul over here, kind of when he starts, when we're first introduced to him. And then we see kind of him on completely the other side now because of what Christ has done. I want you to be paying attention. Notice the flip that, that Luke is doing here in the passage. And then I want to maybe kind of challenge you to be thinking about, okay, so this is who I was before I knew Jesus. Where along that path am I now? Am I like Paul today? And it's specifically, I don't know if you noticed the title of the message, but is in, in loving my enemies. In loving my enemies. We note the, the man that Paul was in chapter 22, 4. It's, uh, it's, it says, I persecuted the followers of this way to their death, arresting them, both men and women, and throwing them into prison. Pay attention. He was full of anger and murder towards his enemies at that time. He also, we also see this uh, um, confirmed in uh, Acts 22, 17 to 20 as well. Paul hated his enemies. And he sets his intentions to fight against them. And really, when we look at what Paul did, to destroy his enemies. Now, I'm not going over the whole story again. We're not reading all of it because we've actually seen this already twice in Acts. And so we are familiar with the person of, Paul, of Saul and how he persecuted the Christians who at that time were his enemies. In his heart, he wanted to destroy them. He wanted to win against them and to murder them. He was okay with that. Anger, bitterness, and murder drove his fight against his enemies. Now listen, though, listen, 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 listen. Yet at that time, no doubt, Paul did not think he was doing something wrong. If you would have asked Saul, well... Isn't God a God of love? Doesn't he say that to Moses? A God of loving kindness. Doesn't God call himself that to Moses? Paul, probably knowing exactly the passage you're talking about by reference and title and could probably quote the whole verse, would say, well, yes. Well, then, Paul, why are you killing Christians? Doesn't that seem wrong? But Paul would go, no, 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 no. These are enemies. You don't know what they've done. You don't know what they've said. These are enemies. Therefore, Paul would have said, I am justified in how I treat them. Not only am I justified in how I treat them, I am justified by how I feel towards them. How I feel towards them. I am justified in that. You don't know who these people are. So without question, anger, bitterness, murder in his heart, yet feeling incredibly justified, even righteously justified about how he felt towards 
his enemies. We too often justify and use righteous arguments to justify our not loving our enemies. And the feelings and the bitterness and the anger and the things we feel, how we treat, what we say about our enemies. Paul lived this way once, but Paul truly found the Lord, or really the Lord actually found him on the road to Damascus. And what is cool about this passage is that we see how Paul now in Jesus Christ treats his enemies. So what is taking place in the passage? Chapter 21, verse 27 to 32 kind of just gives us a really clear kind of quick overview. So I am going to read that. It says, when the seven days were nearly over, and that was the seven days of his purification to prove to the Jews that we talked about that last week, or the week before actually, was almost done, nearly over. Some Jews from the province of Asia saw Paul at the temple. They stirred up the whole crowd and seized him, shouting, fellow Israelites, help us. This is the man who teaches everyone everywhere against our people and our law and, and this place. And besides, he has brought Greeks into the temple and defiled this holy place. They had previously seen uh, Tropimus, the, Eph- the Ephesian in the city, with Paul and assumed that Paul had brought him into the temple. The whole city was aroused and the people came running from all directions. Okay, so note that. I want you to note that. They came running. They were, this was serious. They came running from all directions. I just, just a thought. In our day and age, as good cultural uh, Canadians, what would it take for a group of people just to go running towards something? Right? What would that take in our culture? Think about Nip One. Think there's something going on in Nip One. What would it have to be for a, gr- a whole bunch of just Nip One, Saskatoon, Saskatchewanian Canadians to go just running towards something? This is, they're, they're annoyed, okay? They're, this is, this is getting serious. Running towards, uh, running from all directions, seizing Paul, they grabbed him from the temple, and so they dragged him out, dragging him from the temple, and immediately the gates were shut. While they were trying to kill him, news reached the commander of the Roman troops that the whole city of Jerusalem was in an uproar. At once, he took some officers and soldiers and ran down to the crowd, then the soldiers, when the soldiers saw the, uh, saw the, when, sorry, the rioters saw the commander and his soldiers, they stopped beating him. Note in Luke's description here, while they were trying to kill him, and also note in verse 32, when, they, when, um, when the rioters saw the commander and his soldiers, they stopped beating him. So they were trying to kill him by beating him to death. That's what's going on right now. Any of you uh, have gone through something like that? Think about your enemies. What have your enemies done to you? Would it be close to this? You might feel like that, right? But likely none of you, the people that we don't treat with love, none of us have been in that place where they have surrounded us and they were literally trying to beat us to death with their fists and by kicking, right? This passage calls into question, who is your enemy? Or, or maybe, who are you treating like an enemy? As good Christians, we might uh, not like to use this word. <coughs> Many of us would probably be like, well, I don't really have an enemy. I don't have an enemy. That's maybe a bad, a bad word. But, but who are your enemies? Who is your enemy? Who are you treating like an enemy? Often we have people in our lives that we are hostile towards. And we treat them, we, we act towards them as if they are an enemy, if we're honest. Who in your life are, your, are you angry with? Who are you treating like an enemy? Who is that person or persons who just rub you the wrong way? Who are you treating like an enemy? Who is that person or persons who you fight, find yourself fighting and arguing with the most? Who are you treating like an enemy? Who do you just not like? 
Who are you willing not to forgive? Who are you willing not to truly forgive? Who are you treating like an enemy? Who are you not willing to reach out to in love and mend your relationship with them? Who are you treating like an enemy? Who are you embittered against? Who are you treating like an enemy? Who, when you talk about them, you can't help but start get... Uh, even just talking about them, you start to feel a little... Who are you treating like an enemy? Do you have one of these people in your life or persons in your life? Do you know the feelings I'm talking about in your life? Do you get what I'm saying? We might not call them enemies, but many of us have people in our lives that we treat like enemies. Who is your enemy? Who comes to mind this morning as I talk about this? We know that Paul treated his enemies before he knew Jesus Christ. The, we know the feelings he had, the actions he took towards them. And we know how we treated our enemies before we knew Jesus Christ. We know how we treated our enemies before we knew Jesus Christ. Right? And then we know how Paul treated his enemies after. What we see in this passage. And we also know how we, how we still treat our enemies how we treat our enemies, even after knowing Jesus Christ. Here in the passage, <clears throat> about 25 years or so, or so later, Paul starts to share, and he, 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 says, he, he, he says what he did. Now note, note that about 25 years ago, in Jerusalem, Paul was present. Remember at the beginning of Acts? When Stephen was Beat, be, be, beaten to death, right? He was stoned to death. And he was, he was okay with that. In fact, that spurred Paul on to, to set the direction of his life at that time towards persecuting and killing Christians. So 25 years later, shortly after that time, on the road to Damascus, he met Jesus Christ. And so this is about 25 years Later, as Paul has walked with Jesus Christ. And what do we see Paul do after receiving this incredible beating? And remember that he was a Roman citizen. We'll talk about this probably a little bit next week. But there was a pretty serious, that's a pretty serious offense for Jews, non-Roman citizens, to be beating a Roman citizen, especially if they were wealthier. And they came from, and if they came from a, an honored city, that was, a, that was a serious offense. In fact, Paul could have turned this all around on his enemies. But what does he do? In 2139, we pick up Paul's response to his enemies. Paul answered, I am a Jew from Tarsus in Cilicia, a citizen of no ordinary city. Note why he says that. Please let me speak to the people. After receiving the commander's per per permission, Paul stood on the steps and motioned to the crowd. When they were all silent, he said to them in Aramaic, Brothers and fathers, listen now to my defense. When they heard him speak in, to them in Aramaic, which was their language, they became very quiet. And Paul said, and what does Paul say? I'm not going to read it. But basically, he begins to share his testimony about what God has done for him and what God had done to him. We really see two important truths here. The first one is simple, but it's important. Paul aims to speak in his enemy's own language. And the second is he responds to their attack with love. And he aims through love to share the testimony of what Jesus has done in his life so that his enemies he here in this, in this context, the ones that were just beating him, might find Jesus and be saved. 
So let's look at the first one. <coughs> Paul speaks in his, in, in, in his enemy's language. He, we, we recognize in the passage, we didn't look at it, uh, we didn't just read it, but when Paul speaks to the Roman commander, he speaks in Greek, and the Roman commander goes like, what, you speak Greek? So notice that. But then he also speaks Aramaic to the, to the Jews, which was, which was their language. This is an act of humility and a clear sign that reveals Paul's heart towards wanting to seek and build understanding between himself and his enemies. Guys, it is so important to approach our enemies and situations where tensions are high with humil- the humility of Jesus Christ. So often we engage with our enemies not from a heart of humility, but a heart of self-righteous justification. Isn't that how often we address our enemies? A heart of anger, a heart of rage for what they have done to us. Paul could have have let anger and self-righteous pride drive him. What they did was wrong, and it was actually quite severe in the Roman world. And the proof of it was evident. He was likely bleeding, and the, the impact of the blows probably hadn't even fully, it was fully swollen yet. So it was evident. The evidence was right there what they were doing. Yet God calls his children to live in humility. It is one of the key characteristics of Jesus Christ who lives in us, who lives in us. I'm going to say that again. It is the one key characteristics of Jesus Christ who lives within us. And we've talked about this before. I won't spend much time on it. Philippians 2, 3 to 8 says, Do nothing out of selfish ambition or vain conceit, but rather in humility value others above yourselves, not looking to your own interests, but each of you to the interests of others. In your relationship with one another, have the same mindset of Christ Jesus. Guys, listen to Paul. This is Paul writing. And then listen to what we just read about in terms of what Paul is doing. Right? You see, you see this, Paul lived this out in our passage this morning. He lived it out. He, what was his chief concern? Well, they were just beating the crap out of me. But what is his thinking? What do they need? What do they need? So then his message becomes about sharing Jesus with them. They need Jesus. He needs a hospital. But what do they need? They need Jesus. He says, in your relationships with one another, he's talking about believers, but he's just talking about with everyone. If it applies to believers, it applies to everyone. Have the same mindset as Jesus Christ, who, being in the very nature God, did not consider equality with God something to be used for his own advantage. Rather, he made himself nothing by taking the very nature of a servant, being made in human likeness, and being found in the appearance of a man, he humbled himself by becoming obedient to death, even death on the cross. The, one of the key characteristics of the person we follow and the one that we serve and the one who we claim lives in us is this humility that is constantly considering others more importantly than self. In, in, in Christ, we are to approach our enemies first in humility. Now, Also, in speaking their language, Paul aims to build an understanding of clarity and unity in this, act, it, this, this is an act of love. In, the leadership, in leadership uh, teaching, there's a, po- a popular sticky statement which says, clarity is kindness. And, that, and the understanding that is that the more clear we are with the people we lead, the more clear we are with the people around us, that's an act of kindness. When we take time to make sure that what we are saying and what we are trying to communicate, communicate is clear, That's an act of love. That's an act of kindness. So as leaders, we should be engaged in being careful that we're communicating clearly. It's an act of kindness. That that, that applies to dads, and that applies to moms, and that applies to brothers and sisters, that applies to grandmas and grandpas, that applies to church leaders, that applies to pastors, that applies to roommates in the dorm. It applies to everything. When I take time to make sure that I'm clear about what I want, what I think, that's an act of kindness because that's going to help they're not developed, what? Between you and the other person, what? Right? Tension. 
enemies, that kind of thing, right? And so often it's just like, you know, you get mad. Oh, come on. I already said, I already said this. I already told you that. And the person's like, uh, what? Oftentimes it's not because they forgot. Oftentimes it's because we're not very clear. And, and then the person that's listening, I see, <laughs> uh, I, uh, I see people going, oh, yeah, that happens to us maybe. Uh, and then the person that's listening thinks they, they heard and they did hear and they think they understand. But you know what? They don't understand exactly what's in your head because you're maybe not communicating it so well, right? I, I'm, like, I'm like this, especially when I get si- excited. If I get excited on a thought and I'm moving really fast, uh, I don't know if you noticed or not. I'm sure some of you have. Sometimes I don't, I don't say words because I'm moving so quickly. I have to be very careful in my, my message to make sure that I'm saying all the words in the sentence and not just like, okay, they understood. They're understanding what I'm saying, so I'm moving so quickly because I'm getting excited about what we're talking about. That's not kindness. It's not love. Chances are people won't understand exactly when I'm leaving out words. And I do that with my wife and I do that with my kids. So there's, the, there's this understanding that being clear is an act of kindness. And it moves towards understanding, and that moves towards unity, right? Understanding and clarity move towards unity. And this is important at, at, at all the time, but in perhaps most important when we're dealing with our enemies, Perhaps most important when we're dealing with our enemies. Note uh, that in early Genesis, when the pride of man was driving them to build a tower to heaven in united defiance against God, what does God do? I'm going to say that again. Note in Genesis, when the pride of man was driving them to build a tower to heaven in united defiance against God, what does God do? Genesis 11.6, the Lord said, If as one people speaking the same language, they have begun to do this, then nothing they plan to do will be impossible for them. Come, let us go down and confuse their language so that they will not understand each other. So the Lord scattered them from there, from there all over the earth, and they stopped building the, the city. So we see that their, la- their one language allowed them unity against God's call for them to cover the earth. And to not be so stubborn to think that they could build a tower into heaven. Right? This is not like the tower thing is not really the problem. It's not like God just hates tall buildings, right? That's not really what's at the core of that. What's at the core of that is man's stubborn heart to think we will make it back into God's presence our own way. We deserve to be in heaven. And we will make it back to God's presence our own way. That's what's really going on. And so, what does God do? He, distur- he disturbs their languages. What does that do? That, so be, recognize that's understanding. He, he doesn't allow them to understand each other, and if they don't understand each other, they don't stand in unity. Right? How many times do we get into relationships where we could call the other person an enemy? And even if we would never call, we're good Christians, we would never call them an enemy. But we treat them like one. How often is it because we have a misunderstanding and that misunderstanding drives at the heart of unity with that person, right? And our unity is divided. In that instance, this topic actually gets quite <clears throat> larger when we get into uh, Jesus Christ coming as the Word in John 1.1, 1, 1, right? In the beginning was the Word and the Word was with God and the Word was God. Uh, and understanding that, that, um, that Greeks especially understood the word logos as that which brought understanding, right? This, this, this incredible way that you could write something. Remember, in, in that time, uh, you could, they, they weren't used to this idea that you could write something down on paper and then you could pass it around to other people and everyone could have the same, the same message, the same truth, and, 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 and they saw it as truth. In some senses, in the early understanding of Logos and the early understanding of the word and and written word, it was almost mystical that you could send your thoughts exactly how you put them down magically to someone else and they could open that scroll and they could read it even though you're not there. Right? It's like cell phones would have blew their mind. But that's kind of how it was at the beginning, this idea 
And so we see that this understanding of, of understanding through word is actually very important. We won't get into it. We'll just say that. So the word of God leans into this idea that understanding brings clarity, and clarity brings unity is actually quite important. And we see that Paul engages in that by just being willing to speak their language. Being willing to speak their language. So our first applicational question is, when it comes to your enemies, right? Are you speaking their language? Test your heart. Are you speaking their language? So number one, first of all, are you, are you moving towards them with humility? Are you moving towards the situation with humility? And then number two, are you endeavoring to understand? Are you moving towards them with understanding, desiring clarity, and desiring unity? That's why Paul speaks their language. He wants it to be clear. He doesn't want misunderstanding here. And he wants to build a bridge of unity with his enemies. Are you speaking their language with the people that come to mind as we talk about our enemies? Or in your heart, are you really kind of wanting something else if you're honest? Like maybe vindication or justice or revenge or even to hurt them back, make them suffer. Or maybe you just want to be proven right you want to show them that you're smarter than them, that you are right and they are wrong. In humility, are you aiming towards understanding, kindness, and unity? Are you trying to speak their language? Next, we see that Paul, and this is probably the most important part, we see that Paul, speaking in their language, starts sharing the testimony of Jesus Christ and the work that Jesus Christ has done in his life. And note, note that Paul focuses on, uh, note what he focuses on. He aims to connect with these people by saying uh, his story. Note that the people are just trying to kill the Christian. And what story does Paul engage them with? Right? Telling about his, his early years. Right? He's really saying, I was just like you. I was just like you. You know how much you hate the Christian right now that you wanted to beat him to death for what is done. He is saying, I was just like that. I get you. But then I met Jesus. And he shares Jesus' interruption into his life on the road to Damascus. And we see now, what is he doing? Paul is loving his enemy. Think about it. If the Bible is true, if Jesus Christ is the Savior of the world, the peace giver, the hope bringer, the spring of joy, the grace provider, the, forgive, the forgiver of all sins, the source of light and the source of life, our shield and protector, the door to eternal life, if this is true, then telling others about him and sharing the truth of the, of the loving forgiveness and grace, the loving forgiveness and grace, found only in Jesus Christ, is the most loving thing a person can do for another person. Do you get that? Living Jesus and sharing Jesus with others, and specifically His love, but His grace and mercy and forgiveness is the most loving thing you could do for another human being. Recognize how much further that goes than just your enemies. Yes! Share Jesus with your enemies. But fathers, share Jesus with your wife. Live him out in your life with your kids. Mothers, share Jesus with your kids. Siblings, brothers and sisters, share Jesus. Live him out. Talk about his love. Share Jesus with others. It's the most loving thing a person can do. Grandparents, elders, pastors, friends, Share Jesus, right? So Paul here is now completely different, isn't he? What did he used to do to his enemies? And now what is he doing with his enemies? After walking with Jesus Christ, he is literally sharing with them, listen now, the greatest gift he can give. He's sharing with them the biggest treasure he has. To Paul, there is nothing more, 
There is nothing greater he could give these people but to hope that they would listen and that they too would find Jesus and find his grace, find his mercy, and be restored to their creator. There is no greater act of love but to live out Jesus and his love and to share about the greatest act of love and the greatest source of love, and that's Jesus Christ. And this is what John, I mean, to be really honest, guys, this is what 1 John is all about. If you, if you want to read that, I would love to just jump over and just spend a couple more hours talking about this. And we see this kind of this idea all over Scripture. I would encourage you guys, don't just read this passage this week. Read this passage again. Okay, Acts 21 and Acts 22, read that. And then jump over to 1 John, uh, chapter 4 especially, but all of 1 John, read that. At the source of Christ at the person, at the root of being a Christ follower is this unexplainable love, yes, to the people we love. And it's not like the human love. There's a difference there. In fact, in 1 John 4, he's trying to, he's trying to say that. But this God-like love that's unexplainable. Paul here is loving his enemies and begins to tell them, about his encounter with Jesus Christ and how it changed his life. Paul is able to love his enemies because he too has once an enemy of Christ. And Jesus Christ first loved him. Romans 5, uh, 9 to 11 says, Since we have now been justified by his blood, how much more shall we be saved from God's wrath through him? For if while we were God's enemies, we were reconciled to him through the death of his son. Did you get that? We were God's enemies. You were God's enemies. Paul understood he was an enemy of God. Yet through him, he has been reconciled to Christ. Now how much more, having been reconciled, shall we be saved through his life? Not only this... So is so. But we also boast in God through our Lord Jesus Christ, through whom we have now received reconciliation. We were God's enemies. And what, and what did God do for us? What did this Jesus that we serve and follow and claim, right, that we self-identify with? We are Christians. We are Christ followers. What did he do for us when we were enemies? Jesus, Jesus Christ says this in Luke uh, 6, 20, 27, to 36. But to you who are listening, I say, love your enemies. Do good to those who hate you. Bless those who curse you. Pray for those who mistreat you. If someone slaps you on one cheek, turn to them the other also. If someone takes your coat, do not withhold your shirt from them. Give to everyone who asks of you. And if anyone takes what belongs to you, do not demand it back. Do to others as you would have them do to you. If you love those who love you, what credit is that to you? Even sinners love those who love them. And if you do good to those who are good to you, what credit is that to you? Even sinners do that. And if you lend to to those from whom you expect repayment, what credit is that to you? Even sinners lend to sinners, expecting to be repaid in full. But love your enemies. Do good to them. Lend to them without expecting to get anything back. Then your reward will be great, and you will be children of the Most High. Because he is kind to the ungrateful and wicked. Be merciful just as your Father is merciful. In closing, I have three questions. One, brothers and sisters in Jesus Christ... Who are you treating like an enemy? And think about this. This is what I want you to think about this, okay? I want you to put this together. If we're not sharing Jesus and his love with them, we're treating them like an enemy. You might think, and I think we often think, I might have one or two enemies in my life. Those people that really get my goat, okay, I see what this message is about. I need to reconcile. I need to love those one or two people in my life. Yes, you do. Christ lives in you. You are a follower, right? You are a servant in his moments. Remember, every moment is amazing because every moment God is there. Coupled that with we are his servants. 
That means every moment is his, and we are just a servant, servant in it, right? So yes, we are to call, we are to love, we are to reconcile, we are to reach out to our enemies. But there's a greater perspective there. What would be the, those people that I really, uh, yeah, they're in that, that group. But how about all the other people that I'm not sharing the love of Christ with? That I'm not loving with the love of Christ. That I'm not engaging them to try to reach out and help them know Jesus. What would you call those people? If the Bible is true and the Jesus we know is the Savior of the world who redeems and restores and forgives, if that's true, then what would you call those people that you're not really interested in sharing that love with them, that person with them? What do you call those people? I'm not sure what you would call those people. But if you have the gift of life and the hope of eternity and you have the message of that and you're not willing to share that with just these people here, Okay, yes, I have my enemies, but what, do you, what, what would you call those people to you? Right? Brothers and sisters, in Jesus Christ, who are you treating like enemies? When it comes to your enemies, now these are the people that really get it. You're right. Number two, are you speaking their language? Are you endeavoring to speak their language? Humility? Moving towards understanding and clarity and unity. Are you speaking their language? And then number three, are you remembering what God did for you when you were his enemy? Are you remembering that? Are you remembering that? We were his enemy. And how did he treat us? With love, grace, and mercy. We are called to love our enemies in Jesus Christ. I pray by the work and the leading of the Holy Spirit that we are in word and in deed this week moving towards loving our enemies. Let's pray. Lord God in heaven, uh, so often I think we think we're doing pretty good. And we can kind of see the, the big issues in our lives. But Lord God, I, I fear what you see even in me, Lord especially in me. Lord God, I pray that you would give me a love for my enemies. I pray that you would give us a love for our enemies. That one thing that people would say about this church, Lord God, I pray, is that they would be shocked about how we treat others, especially those who would be kind of our enemies, who would try to bring us down. God, that we would have a supernatural unexplainable love for our enemies. God, I just pray if you're speaking to anyone's heart right now, if there are people in this room, if there are brothers and sisters in Jesus Christ, those that have given their heart to you, recognizing that you brought them into the fold, that you treated them as, as, as dear and you loved them and you showed mercy even when they were your enemy. God, if there's people here that have enemies and you have them on... That's, you have them on their heart. You, you, they know. They know who they are. Lord God, I just pray by the work of your Holy Spirit and in the name of Jesus Christ that you do a work in us this morning. And Father, that you start breaking down walls if we have walls up to our enemies. Because God, if we have a wall up to our enemies, we also, even if we realize it or not, we have a wall up to you because you call us to love our enemies. And so Lord God, chip away at that wall. Take it down this morning, Lord God. Do something awesome in our hearts. Lord, I pray that you would just plant a seed that would grow quickly of love for the people that we consider enemy, for the people that we treat as enemy. And Lord God, I pray that you would do that this morning in the name of Jesus. Thank you for your love and your mercy. Thank you that you saved us while we were still acting as enemies towards you. Thank you for forgiving us. I pray that would remind that we would be reminded of that truth every moment. We are saved by your love. May your love fill us, Lord God. In the name of Jesus, we pray these things. Amen.